okay, I'm not coming into this wanting to be the big time producer. I need to grind. I need to make up for the grind that I've missed over these past 10 years where there's other people in this industry that I'm standing next to that came up being those assistants and yeah. grabbing coffee and, and moving soap boxes and shoe boxes and all that type of stuff. So it was just understanding that, yes, I have an opportunity to get a TV show on the air, which is rare in itself, but I need to define what my grind is in order to sustain this and then possibly have different ventures outside of uh, All American, which I've been fortunate to have. Good. All right. Welcome to Profits and Process. I'm your host, Ryan Grant, and today's episode I'm excited about because, first off, we got a fellow baller. Finally, <laughs> finally, we get somebody in here that actually is an athlete. No, um, this young man, he's talking about inspirational. And first of all, to be able to transition from ball at the level that we play and the commitment that comes along with that, almost what seems like seamlessly, I don't know if it was, but what seemed like <laughs> seamlessly into an entirely other intimidating field that is all over the place and do it at a high level and be respected in that field is tremendous. And so, you know, I'm super excited to be able to sit down with Spencer Pacinger and really just dive into your process, brother. Yeah, thank you for having me. No, I appreciate you, man, We've, taking uh, the time. We feel like we've known each other for 10 years and have never met. Word. <laughs> <laughs> we live, all, our worlds are certified, indirectly connected, man. Yeah. And I like that because I think that this will... This will bridge that gap. And now I already know we'll, we're going we're gonna to rock a little closer, mm-hmm. man. Um, I start off something. We're going to do something new with this where we ask everyone to pick from the library and uh, really explain why they pick with intention. So what do, you, what do you got on the table for us? I picked Cast by Isabel uh, Wilkerson. Um, this is actually being turned into, I believe it's a movie that Ava DuVernay is producing. Um, my grandfather passed away in 2020. And it really made me want to dive into uh, the Great Migration and okay. everything that came from it, came before it. And this book, this book sort of connects the caste system in India to American racism oh. and kind of builds up the, how American racism was built off the back of the caste system, um, which also plays into the idea of the Great Migration and why black people in the South um, between, what was it, 18, I want to say about like 1860 to like 1970, yeah. um, why it is one of the greatest like human migrations in the in world history, but it's also drastically the most underreported migration in human history. Why is that? Do we um, know why? I don't know. I don't know. I I feel like it's because again, it's black people. Yeah. So there's there's already some there's already a discrimination mm. uh, point with that, but. Um, with my grandfather passing away, uh, this is a guy that, that grew up in plain dealing, uh, right? 45 minutes outside of Shreveport, you know, he had scars on his legs and his hands from picking cotton as a sharecropper. And he, he ended up passing away in his own bed in one of the richest black neighborhoods in the country in Ladera Heights, okay. not, not too far from here. So, um, just thinking about his migration, um, allowed me to dive deeper into the great migration. And this is one of those books along my journey of just understanding how potentially bad the South was yeah. for people during that time to go, I don't know what's up north or in the Midwest or out west, but that great unknown is better than the hell that I'm in here, that right. I'm here right now. So. That's always a fascinating when I think about that in reference to what people were going through. It's yeah. like the unknown of expansion, the unknown of migration. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, people, whatever they were going through, they're like, nah, I'm willing to go into a space and I don't know. I don't know the terrain. I don't know the climate. I don't know anything aspect, but it's got to be better than what I'm going through right now in my world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was he was 17 years old, just graduated high school, 
and he had a family member working up uh, just outside of, of Detroit, Michigan. And he moved up there with maybe two shirts, a pair of pants, a pair of the shoes that he was wearing, and built the life that I'm currently living. Um, and just immense respect for him, for my grandmother in general, and just for everybody that came out of that. Well, we say we're, we're trying to create icebreakers to kind of develop, develop <laughs> the conversation in here. I got another icebreaker. I'll give it up. Your rookie year, you did <laughs> kick our butt. Still stings just yeah, a little bit. Yeah, listen, I, you know what's funny? <laughs> I As much as, listen, the, the Giants beat us every time I thought we were going to win the Super Bowl. The Giants were the ones who took it from us. And it was one of those bittersweet things because I came from the Giants. Mm -hmm. So I was still really close with a lot of the guys. And it was like, well, if I'm going to lose in that manner, at least I'm going to lose to my guys, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it definitely hurt, that one, in your, your rookie year, because it was an ass whoop. It wasn't anything close, you know? Um, yeah, we, we had something working in our favor during that. That was... Uh, you know, almost by week 13. We, we weren't great by any metric um, during the regular season. We started off, I think, 6-2 and two going into our bye week, and then we went into infamously no win November. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we dropped like four or five of the next six games, and by week 13 or so, it was when to go home. So this is around when Victor Cruz became Victor Cruz. Yep. Um, this is when Eli just locked into a, to a level I'd never seen before. Um, and just the hierarchy on a team, you understand, like, an NFL locker room has its own hierarchy. You got the, the $50 million guys, but then you got the, the rookies that are scraping by on, like, 700 k maybe. Yeah. Call them union workers. Yeah, so <laughs> I think, I think what, what set us apart is very early on, like, we didn't really trust our defensive coordinator. Um, like, a lot of guys didn't really like him that much. Okay. But we said it's his game plan or nothing. So early on, we set this hierarchy where the rookies – I think one thing that set us apart was we had about eight or nine rookies doing all the special teams. It allowed the older players to only focus on their position. Yeah. So guys like Mark Herzlick, uh, Henry Hanoski, Tyler Sash, rest in peace, um, Jaquan Williams, Greg Jones, like complete rookie first year players that said, you know what, we're going to allow you guys to be great on defense and offense. The rookies got this. So it just allowed for these players that, you know, the intro rows of the world, to possibly take an extra 10, yeah. play, 10 or 15 plays off of their legs for games. That's big. Yeah. It's f funny. I remember that you guys were in that position of win or go home. And your last loss, I believe, was against us in the regular season mm -hmm. when we came into New York. Mm -hmm. And I was the captain that game. We rotated captains every week. And I told the dudes before the game, listen, we can't keep this game tight. <laughs> Our history with this team, we got to push them up against the wall, and push them through the wall. And we went at the end of the game, last second. And I remember after that game, Tuck and B. Jacobs came over to me in the middle of the field, and they are like, we'll see you soon. Yep. And I knew as soon as they yep. said that, I was like, fuck. Yep. <laughs> like, they feel, because we were one of the best teams in the league, if not the best team in the league, the fact that it was such a close game, they were like, oh, we can play. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, mm -hmm. we don't want this. That's not what we want. And then sure enough, you guys just came and destroyed us that, that playoff game. But now that we're done with ball, <laughs> like, yeah, we're, we're past that. Like, we're, we're, we've grown past this, yeah. this sport of football, this savage sport. Um, what you've done is impressive, bro. Like, Thank you. literally, Thank man. You. And I always start with a question of, what would you say for yourself? What do you do? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still trying to answer that question. I'm still trying to find the most like streamlined answer to that. But in short, I've landed on the idea that I'm a bridge. Um, it's my job to bring resources from one area to another, whether that's through storytelling, um, through some of the community stuff that I'm doing, through some of the, the, the business ventures that I've either invested in or have helped out. Um, I see myself as a bridge guiding resources in whatever direction they need to go. Coming from ball and you having such a strict routine, you know, like we, of course, our schedules are crazy. It's intense. The the standard of performance is so high. What were you able to bring with you stepping into an industry that is, to me, not as solidified in any capacity, you know? 
Yeah. At all. Yeah. It's, it's not. And I make the joke that for some reason I like the feeling of not having job security. Um, you know, I, I was an undrafted rookie coming in, played seven years, won a Super Bowl, lived the highs of the highs, had some you, of the you lows of the lows. Appreciate you. <laughs> uh, that, it's, yeah, it's a... It's a what, it's, that, what that creates, man, stepping into the league with that, people don't understand. It, you come in with a different di dynamic, a different yeah. mentality. Yeah, it feel like if you're coming to the league how we came into the league, you have to have a sense of awareness about you. Right. You have to build up your self-awareness to the point where, like, I say that is my superpower. Like, for the most part, I always know how I'm being perceived and what I'm putting out into the world and the possible directions that it can go based yeah. off of my moves. Right. So I think transitioning into this space, I knew very much that I wanted to be in this industry from a sense of from writing, from producing, um, I didn't just want to be a name that just showed up when the lights were bright on the red carpet or whatnot. I wanted to do the work. Um, a, a lot of the times in the league, I was tasked with, specifically on special teams, handling their other special teams dog. You know, blocking the biggest guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, running with their, their more scrappy players. And it just got to the point where the coaches looked at me and said, this is your guy. We don't have to tell you anything else beyond that. Like, we understand. You know, you know how to prepare. Mm -hmm. I know the assignment. I know how to do that. So... Understanding my own strength, strengths and weaknesses in the league, um, I just carried that over into the industry where I realized I'm coming into this not having gone to film school, not having had that 10 plus years of, of PA work and kind of coming up and grinding through that system to get to a, an actual producer where I kind of skipped a couple steps mm -hmm. getting this TV show on the air. Um, but it was the self-awareness that I had in the moment of being like, okay, I'm not coming into this wanting to be the the big time producer, I need to grind. I need to make up for the grind that I've missed over these past 10 years where there's other people in this industry that I'm standing next to that came up being those assistants and yeah. grabbing coffee and, and moving soap boxes and shoe boxes and all that type of stuff. So it was just understanding that, yes, I have an opportunity to get a TV show on the air, which is rare in itself, but I need to define what my grind is in order to sustain this and then possibly have different ventures outside of uh, All-American, which I've been fortunate to have. Did you feel equipped in the ability to do that? Like, having that awareness of, like, oh, I need to do this, did you feel equipped in, like, okay, I can, though? And I, or did oh, you feel absolutely. like, I got to, I got to, okay, I got to, I got to... Absolutely. I, I felt equipped to do it. I just needed to know... I just need to understand the landscape. Um, mm -hmm. I think oftentimes a lot of athletes, we're, we're told you have skills, you have these things that can translate into any industry because as an athlete, you're taught to lock in. You're taught yeah. to put your blinders on. You're taught to, to grind harder and longer than the next man. And you have that certain level of grit about you that other people just didn't come up with. All that's true, but what's not talked about a lot is the language that you have to learn in any new industry. Mm -hmm. So you're talking being in some of these writers' rooms, and they're talking, they're throwing these phrases out there, and oh, let's blue sky some ideas. I'm like, what the fuck is blue sky? What does that mean? <laughs> like, it's cloudy outside right now, you know. But I'm realizing, like little by little, like oh, there's a language that streamlines information in these rooms that I need to pick up on. There's a way to write notes when you're screenwriting to streamline just the onboarding of ideas. Totally so, new skill sets. Whole new skill set. Yeah. So it, it, it wasn't so much, I'm in and I have a TV show on the air, now I'm a professional in it. It was like, no, I kind of backdoored this opportunity because of my story and because, you know, a Super Bowl and all. It's like all the, the fun poppy things that you can broadcast during a marketing campaign Absolutely. of why this TV show is a thing. But when, when you're in those rooms and they're literally throwing lingo out there and, you know, they're, they're whiteboarding things and blue skying things and stuff, you're like, okay, I need to learn. I need to learn this language in order for me to be successful. There's enough self-respect that you had and like the way you looked at yourself to legitimize. Because you could have taken the other route and just said, you know what, I'm going to ride this. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to ride this and I'm yeah. not going to actually put myself, I'm just going to take advantage of whatever opportunities come from this. But no, you actually honed your own skills and said, you know what, let me legitimize myself in these spaces so that I even have an even greater level of respect from my peers and people that I respect in this field. Because I... I think essentially a lot of times when people, you know, and we are in a day and age where people can cross brand, cross market and mm -hmm. everything, you know, everybody's a brand at this point mm -hmm. in time. So we take a lot of what we do in one field and then immediately 
put it into another field. And a lot of times, I think some it can dilute maybe. Mm-hmm dilute essentially what we're bringing to the table because people that have spent 10 years, 15 years, 20 years in a particular field see someone else do something else and they automatically think, well, wait a minute. Why are they legitimized to the same capacity? And yeah. they don't necessarily do the work. Exactly. You know, respect the craft exactly. in that capacity. So I think that that's, that's number one, super admirable, but it all it has done is enhanced. It's, all, it's, it's allowed you to step in other rooms and what seems to be, you know, just broaden your scope in regards to what you're trying to create. So I, I there, respect that a lot, man. There, there was one, there was one defining moment that I still think back to of like, because like you said, when you've done something great in one industry, you can go into other industries and kind of use that energy from prior space to, to kind of glide through a couple of things. And season one, um, mind you, I'm still trying to like learn this whole new space. So I'm yeah. in the writer's room. I'm on set as much as I can be. You know, I'm, I'm shadowing directors. I'm just like, I'm taking it all in, in yeah, this, yeah, 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 in this yeah. thing. But little by little, you you started to hear other producers and crew members and stuff. They they see me as a football player. Like being honest, a lot of them were like, "Oh, you're a football player. Like, you sure you don't want to go play? We'll, we'll take care of this. You go play some more and like come back when it's up." And I'm like, "No, like, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, Let yeah, me I'm be here. here. I'm I'm present. I'm here. I'm learning. I want to I want to do this." So, uh, they. In a roundabout way, they kind of didn't believe that 100% that I wanted to be there, even though I'm physically present. But there was one moment where, when the, the first season of All American, all of our football scenes are shot overnight. So it's like you start at 6 p.m., you end at 8 a.m. We call it beating the sun. So it's maybe 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. The football players, the background players have been in full pads for like six hours at this point. Everybody's tired. Yeah. We're just grinding through these scenes. There's a moment where Spencer's supposed to juke a Drew a couple players, get to the end zone, and land in a spot to where confetti blows right behind them. So right before the person said action, uh, the confetti guy actually blew the cannon before. Oh, shit. And we can't reshoot it like that because it's all confetti. Yeah, so you yeah. can see it's like we kind of like blew our load a little bit. As soon as it happens, I remember me and another producer, we look at each other and we go, we got to clean this up. So we sprinted onto the field, got on our knees, and just started pick like putting it in our pockets, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like this, because we're like we have to clean this up so he can like repack another confetti bomb. So in that moment, everybody started cleaning the background players and everything started cleaning up. We we cleaned it up in maybe three minutes tops. Like didn't lose any time. The next day filming, I'd say like half a dozen crew members came up to me. It was like, hey, I just want to let you know, like I've never seen a producer do that. Like, yeah. I, like people have been in this industry 15, 20 years. Like the producers that we know would sip coffee and watch us pick that up. Oh, but shit. you got on your knees and helped us and like led the charge. And like, we respect you for that. And I remember that being the moment where the producers, the crew members, the actors were like, this guy wants to be here. Yeah. And for me, I thought it was second nature. It was like, no, like there's a problem. Yeah. We team, have to fix shit. it. Yeah, I'm not about to call it. Like, hey, you go fix it. Yeah. And to me, that was the most defining moment of like, I got their respect. I earned their respect by doing the action, you know? I always relate that back to like team stuff. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you learn, the NFL is interesting because it's so different from college in the sense that you are a part of a team that chances are you're not even close to the best person on the team or the most important person. And you learn that (laughs) real quick. However important you thought you were, you're not. Absolutely. So you got to pick up that role. And I think that, that that carries over in a lot of different spaces where people think, oh, oh, not nah, what? He's not supposed to be doing this. Like, yeah. Not nah, the, the football player who, who you know, is interested in film. is like, no, nah, he's not supposed to. Be. It's like, no, no, no. I'm willing to be a part of this because mm-hmm. I want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. And recognizing that I don't know what my role is, but I'm willing to take on different roles no matter the. Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. That's, that's real deal, man. Um, when you look at the routine that we had for ball and our process with our scheduling and how we got ourselves to be good at, you know, you you understand your craft, you know what you do, and, and I know that as a particular role player, you're given an assignment. I know how to mm-hmm. how to handle my business for the week. What does that look like now? So, what does your process look like in regards to your scheduling, your your habits, your routines? In in football, we're extremely regimented. So, you're talking, you're on a schedule from let's say seven a.m. to five or six p.m. Yeah. and almost to the half hour, you are scheduled out. 
it's meetings here, it's eating here, it's rolling and stretching, it's yeah, you know where, 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 like where you, you know what exactly. You even your your body knows exactly where it needs to be. Um, it's this to the point now where I can still. I still know how much I weigh within one or two pounds just because it was our job to know how much we weighed every single day before we stepped onto the field and when we got off the field. Absolutely. So coming out of that, you realize like, oh, I was a professional athlete, but I actually don't know how to craft my own workout. I actually don't know how to, how to like situate 12 hours in a day to yeah. make me productive. And Man. for the first couple of years, it was... I didn't realize that's what I was struggling with until I just had that moment where I'm like, I want to work out. I've always worked out, so I know there's a better, like mentally, physically, I'm better when I get that 30 hour workout yeah. in me. But I don't know how to do this on my own because we have always worked out with 50 to 100 other guys in the weight room. Yep. So Somebody now handed when, you a book that says, yeah, hey, here's going. your book, here's your workout, go do this, write it down, put it in your cubby, and get going. Now, when I'm, when I'm working out or when I did start working out uh, post-league, I'm in a weight room by myself. I'm, I'm, I have my headphones on. I'm, I'm at 24-Hour Fitness, and I don't know anybody else in here when working out was a, was a communal, communal yeah. thing, experience for us. So early on, I had, to, I had to relearn how to do that, and I, I had to ask for help. A lot of the times in the league, you... You ask for help, but it comes from a sense of machismo almost. Yeah. You know, like, hey, I need help, but you know I could have got it anyway. You know, yeah, yeah, I just need yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So here it was, coming out the league, it was being open and honest with the things that I always did, but I didn't know how to do on my own. You know? Uh, I think creating my own schedule was was a big thing for that. It was, I know I need to wake up at 5.30, 6 a.m. in the morning to get that hour and a half in before the kids wake up. I know once I drop the kids off at school, I need to take an hour for myself or me and my wife, we make breakfast together and, and talk about our day and, and have that sort of that meeting yeah. um, just to kind of root our day in and what we're doing, who we are and, and just in love. Um, but then also making sure I'm not tiring myself out by writing for eight hours a day from scheduling too many phone calls in a day because you can get really burnt out. Mm. There's 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 this energy in this industry where if you if you've done something pretty dope, if you have a TV show on the air, if you if you've written a movie, whatever, you can live comfortably off of just like having a podcast or or doing a panel or popping around and being that being that talking head in the industry and not actually work on what you want to work on. More stuff you can just, yeah. yeah, there there were months where I'd go two or three months and realize like, oh fuck, I haven't I haven't written anything in two months because I've done these four podcasts, because I did three a that panel over here because I was thing, speaking right? engagement. The conversation over here. is just continuing to flow yeah, based upon the one thing that exactly. you Exactly. Yeah. And and you could really look up and realize like I'm not doing the thing that I want to do in this industry. And realizing that coupled with, you know, not really knowing how to like design my own workout plans. Yeah. I had to really break down almost by the minute, like what do I want my days to look like? So even now there are some days where I tell my, my producing partner, my other collaborators, like, Hey, I'm, I'm not here on Tuesdays or Thursdays. Cause that's the days where I'm just writing, you know, it's, it's making sure my wife knows like, I'm, I'm going to wake you up at five 30 cause I'm getting out the bed. I know you hate me getting out the bed, but like, I need to do this cause I can't work out at night. That's just, it's in me. I have to get it out early in the morning. So it was really deconstructing my life um, to make it just as optimal for me and my own well being and really realizing that I don't need to grind like we know it how to, like we know how the whole grind culture needs to be. As much as we're so used to working out at a high capacity, it was. So many things were were given to us. So I appreciate you saying that, especially in the route to having a family and making sure that you're giving that time to ground yourself and that being the foundation of that starts my day that that starts everything else because everything else follows from that yeah. so I appreciate that and I think that that essentially goes into like the next phase of the conversation that I want to go where we start talking about what do these stories that you're trying to tell do for you how do they feed you like how essentially are you allowing them to energetically speak your story speak for others 
are they what are they giving to you yeah i mean with with all americans specifically it was such a crash course in this industry where you know you're talking i, I retired december mentally i retired december 27th 2017 by mid April 2018, you're shooting the pilot. Yeah, there was no time that you wasted in there. There's no, there was no time. I, I was actually double dipping um, for my last year and a half playing. So we were, we were creating the pilot my entire last year and a half playing. Oh, wow. I had the meeting with with Warner Brothers, Greg Berlanti's team uh, after year six, and then throughout the prep for year seven, spring ball, all that. Uh, we were actively looking for writers. We were. We found our writer. I was working with her, and ironically, it helped because I was a free agent for much of my last year. That allowed me to work out in the mornings, shower, and then go to her spot or her office to help design what the pilot would be. So I'm talking days where I'm just literally sitting next to her like, all right, this is what we can do. This As an athlete, this is what I would be thinking about, X, Y, Z. And it wasn't until, I think, late November, early December, um, I started getting some bites. You know, injuries, late in the season, some fresh bodies and whatnot. So you're talking... No time to lick my wounds after I retire. No time to lay on the beach and just say, hey, I did that. We went into production with All-American, you know, literally, I think, three or four weeks after I retired. Wow. So I didn't really have a a chance to define the stories that I wanted to tell up until literally, I'd say about six or seven months ago, I really sat down and wanted to understand inside, like, what stories do I want to tell? What What is my calling card? What is, you know, Jordan Peele has his thing. You know yeah. how Ava DuVernay has her thing. And, and all the, you know, Quentin Tarantino has his thing. Mm-hmm. You know, Christopher Nolan, his thing is time. He likes to fuck with time. What I've landed on is I want to tell stories about exceptional black men. Um, and there's there's more to it, but for me, what I get up most for is finding that story of that that sort of hidden figures type story of, oh, this black guy helped define an industry. Oh, this guy. There's, there's a story that I'm producing right now that, you know, hopefully it gets done is about Bill Nunn. You know, yeah. Bill Nunn Jr. Bill Nunn III is Radio Rahim. Radio Rahim was a ball boy for the Pittsburgh Steelers back in the 60s because his father was the first black scout for the Pittsburgh Steelers and helped define, pretty much lay the groundwork for HBCUs uh, players into the NFL. The steel curtain that we all know that's yeah, yeah. like the first best defense ever was largely manned by by athletes from HBCUs. And it was because Bill Nunn Jr. found these players at HBCUs. He recruited from PWIs and stuff. I mean, scouted from PWIs and everything, but it's this crazy dope story of a black guy in the 60s that was a prominent journalist for the Pittsburgh Courier, the largest black newspaper publication in the country at the time. And at 43 years old, he decides to move over to to scouting in the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, oh, wow. scouting department. And those are the stories that I'm interested in. Um, stories like Paul Revere Williams, who the architect of the stars. He's he's built the most yeah, iconic yeah. buildings in Los Angeles. You know, I know his great granddaughter. Um, stories like that of men that understood where they were playing. You know, they understood the racism, the prejudice, yeah, and everything. But they allowed their expertise to lead, and it almost became undeniable. You know, that's for me playing in the league. Like that was always my my model to myself was be undeniable. So when you're looking at when it's cut day, when it's when it's was it Black Sunday, Black Monday, whatever, and the, and the coaches are looking through the to find those 53 men that they can go to war with, when they come across my name, he can do this, he can do this, he doesn't know how to do this, but if we need him to plug a hole, we know we can trust him. To do that, it was having a coach look at my name and not see any weaknesses, and knowing that you're not going to have to deal with me off the field. Yeah, you're, and you can give me my assignment on the field, and know you don't have to worry about me. You're a pro, exactly. So it's finding it's Anybody. finding those stories um, in America and beyond of of exceptional black men and telling those stories. The story is never for us; mm-hmm. it's always for someone else, and you're trying to create a feeling a sense of self, and a lot of times it's for the kids, you know? It's yeah, for people yeah, to just yeah. be able to see in different fields, not just athletes, not just, you know, entertainers, individuals that were trailblazers, but 
did really, really, really impactful things and changed dynamics. Yeah. You know, changed yeah. perceptions, changed dynamics in regards to like how we our ecosystem is changed because that's essentially that's it. That's all we're trying to do. I mean, I, I learned that too from our, from our mutual friend Justin Tut. Well, shout out, shout out to Justin over there. But yeah, right. he's cool. He's, he's okay. Cool. I still call you. I still call you Cap, Justin. Yeah, he um, okay. he all right though. He, he's a decent, <laughs> he's a decent, He's done all right for himself. He's yeah. done okay for himself. But Justin Justin was the guy who. I'm telling you, my rookie year, one of those first couple weeks of practice, because mind you, I was I was a lockout year. Yeah. So we didn't have a spring oh, ball. Oh, I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah. We didn't have a spring ball. You're getting those calls during the oh, draft. Oh, yeah, saying, I'm yeah, going to draft yeah. you. I'm going to That's draft you. That's another thing. You guys didn't have that. We whole... didn't have that. We didn't that. And for those of you that don't know, it's like spring ball is where rookies and new guys on the team learn the playbook. It's it's sort of a it's two imperative months, for the young guys. Yeah. yeah it's, it's two two and a half months of like, coaches aren't there for half the time, but. You're bonding with your teammates. You're understanding like your place on the team. You're learning the playbook. So then by fall camp, you're coming in with some sense of your playbook and can actually compete. 2011, we had the lockout and we didn't get that. Yeah. So I'm telling you, I'm driving down La Cienega um, to, to go train in my high school. Lockout ends. I start fielding calls, end up signing with the Giants, flying out there the next day. Three, four days later, I'm in practice and I'm just like, what the fuck is life right now? Like. I can see that's, the New York skyline right intense. there. Oh, man. Intro role, Justin Tug, Eli, man. Like, what the hell is life right now? Yeah. And I, I remember uh, me and a handful of other rookies were, you know, you can't kneel. As a rookie, you can't take a knee on the field. For, for <laughs> I remember camp. that. So we're all standing there, and, and Justin Tug walks off the Stupid field. Stupid rule, but I remember Yeah. <laughs> Justin Tuck walks off the field, and he's Justin Tuck. You know, this is the of the defense. This is yeah. one of the most beloved giants in giant history. Absolutely. And he comes over, and he goes... I want you guys to go look at the look at the city, uh, the skyline right now. And you can see it; it's beautiful. It's that's what it is. And he goes, "If you ever try to go up against that city, you'll lose. That city's undefeated. So if you disrespect that city, it's not us that will get you out of here. The city will get you out of here." And it was really that grounding moment of being like, "Oh shit, I'm representing a city, and I need to act accordingly." Yeah. But it was Justin Tuck that instilled that in that that small group of rookies. That we were like, he literally said that city is undefeated. And whenever you think you're bigger than that city, that is when you need to get the fuck out of here. I would like to say that I was part of him learning that. <laughs> Being from New York, yeah. when I got to New York, I, I would like to say, I'm, yeah, I'm taking credit for some of that, Jay. Hey. That's my guy, man. But for, I just want to give shouts, really, because to watch him grow as a man and as a leader mm -hmm. and literally to be dominant in the capacity in New York City. Mm -hmm. That's what's always been impressive to yes. me. Like, being dominant in the league, but when you're dominant in the Giants, it's like, man, because with all yeah. the, everything that comes along with, with being in New York, mm -hmm. and as you know, it's hard to win in yeah. New York. Yeah. It's hard when to you, stay at when that, you, you know, do, when you do, oh. they, they will never turn their back on exactly. you when, you, when so, you do win. Absolutely. Yeah, man, that's, that's gold. And that, I'm, I know that that's where, that's, those are the things that I love about, like, team sports and brotherhoods and all these different spaces, mm -hmm. because that, that essentially was a gem mm -hmm. in your process that was gold for you to be able to hear from him somebody that you respect and then take forward in now any field that you go into there's a yeah. level of respect to how you handle yourself you know when you when you're looking at these stories and what you're trying to tell do you feel challenged from how you want to tell them personally or what you think might be the best way to get the story across like how are you how are you attacking that I'm where my most consistent challenge is is not grabbing the low hanging fruit. Um, in the position that I'm in, having played football and now having All American on the air, and it's it's done what it's done over the past five or six years. Uh, I I'm constantly hit up for wanting to tell the next All American, wanting to tell a similar story, wanting to tell the athlete overcoming yeah, yeah. an insurmountable odd and winning the big game, winning the Super Bowl, whatever. Um, and it's, it's extremely hard for me to say no to a lot of those stories because I understand everybody believes that their story is worthy of a TV show, is worthy of a feature, a documentary, or what. And I have to do the work to say, is this a project that I want to work on for the next two or three years of my life? Yeah. So sometimes it's great to, to, to break bread with other creatives and whatnot and... and and again, be that bridge for other athletes that are trying to, to get into the industry in whatever way they want. But 
I have to constantly remind myself that, okay, what are the stories you want to tell? How do you want to tell them? And what new ways you can, you can tell them? So for me personally, I don't want to be the guy that's just telling the CW version of every single story from now on. Yeah. Like I, I, I want to reach the heights of a Jordan Peele, of a, mm-hmm. of a Ava DuVernay, of a Christopher Nolan and beyond. And I truly feel like I can get there. I feel like my my habits can get me there, mm-hmm. but I really have to put sort of a checks and balance um, system in front of those people that reach out to me saying, hey, I have the next All-American. Hey, I can tell my story. Because honestly, you hear some of these stories and you're like, I know you went through it. <laughs> this ain't as cinematic as you think it is, yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> and not, it's, it's like, it's no shade to them, but I'm just like, I, I don't want to get down that wave of telling the same story different ways. I want to challenge myself. Yeah, I could see how it could be easy. Yeah, it, it could be. It's, it could, it be, could be extremely easy, and and some of them are like some of them are good paydays. Some of them, some of them can can possibly set up another big thing. Yeah. But it comes down to a feeling. If I feel like this isn't a story that I personally want to spend the next two or three years on, I have to wash my hands of it. I want to talk about some of your new projects in relation to. Because you are stepping into what seems to be very different from All American mm-hmm. and what you're trying to present and shine light on. The first one that I want to talk to is BS High. <laughs> yeah. Which it is such a wild story that it could have been made and I'm and I don't know, maybe you might know. Maybe it might be made into a parody. You know what I mean? At some mm-hmm. point in time they might make something around it. Mm-hmm. But what made you initially want to tell that story and what was the foundation around it? What were you actually trying to get across? Yeah, I mean, when that game happened, the game happened in uh, late August, yeah. mid to late August 2021. And I didn't watch the game. I didn't even know the game was going on. Yeah. A, a couple hours later, I started seeing it become sort of the number one trending topic on social media. So I looked at some of the clips and I was like, what the fuck is, like, what is yeah, happening? Because you... <laughs> In high school sports, you never find a team, you, you never find a matchup specifically on ESPN where one team physically dominates yeah, where it's- another team in every category. So I just knew there was a story there in that sense, but it was understanding there's a lot of jokes happening right now around this team. These It's not like all 60 of these players or in on the joke. Yeah. So what's the real story? What's, yeah, what's going on behind this? So I hit up my friend. Um, uh, Alex, who works with uh, uh, Adam McKay in Hyper mm-hmm. Object, he's directed a couple movies. He was with Funny or Die, like, and he went to Oregon. Um, we kind of crossed over for like two years or so at Oregon. Um, I hit him up and I was just like, "Yo, I think there's a there's a story here. I think I want to go get it." He sends me a screenshot from Adam McKay. Adam McKay goes, "Holy shit, go get this." That's all I needed. So yeah. I was on social. I found a roster from from Bishop Sycamore. I started hitting up players on Instagram, on Twitter, or just like some way to get me into just a conversation. Yeah. I wasn't trying to like sign the life rights or just, I just want to know what is your perspective on this? Because you guys are the laughing stock in the country right now. Yeah, and let them come in. I know y'all weren't in on this, you know? So I got in, I got in touch with one, one or two coaches, a handful of players. And ironically that way, that same weekend or that next weekend, Oregon was playing Ohio state at the shoe. I was already going to that game because one of my goals, I just want to see all like the best stadiums in the country. You know, I want to go to Happy Valley, Death Valley, all, all those things. So I said, I'm going to be in Columbus. I'd love to like grab dinner with you guys and just understand like your perspective on this. Yeah, what, so, what the hell is going on? Right. So in Columbus, <laughs> in Columbus, I'm kind of, you know, running and gunning. Um, Michael Strahan and his company come out and say, hey, we signed Roy Johnson to a deal we're going to do a documentary about this story. Out of nowhere, I'm like, I'm about to cold text Michael Strahan. He, we, I took a picture with him when we won our Super Bowl on the field, but this guy knows, he doesn't know who the fuck I am, you know? Yeah, he was done by that time. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. so I hit up my, my, my old teammate, Henry Hanoski. I'm like, hey, do you have Michael Strahan's number? He said, yeah, handed it to me. Um, I text Michael Strahan, hey, Michael, this is Spencer Pesky. I don't know if you remember me. I'm, a, I'm an ex-Giant as well, yeah. All-American. 
I'm in Columbus right now. I got a couple guys that are on the team that like, there's an interesting story here. I know you have Roy Johnson. Can we just set up a conversation um, just to understand is there a way that we can work together? I'm also bringing like Adam McKay with me. That next day we go on a call and in that moment we realize like, let's just all do this together. So it was Hyper Object, Adam McKay, Michael Strahan and Smack, um, Matador, um, The Athletic, and then just me and my producing partner, Moore Street. Okay. Um, we sold it to HBO when we had just like a two minute sizzle. So me and Ethan Lewis, we were just running and gunning in Columbus for like an, another week and a half after I had planned to be there. So I sent my wife home and I'm like, yo. I gotta stay out here for a little I'm, bit. I gotta stay. Yeah. Like I'm, this is me producing now. And it was two years of to and from Columbus interviews, bringing the subjects to Los Angeles, interviewing them out here. A lot of the stuff, all the talking head that you saw of Roy mm -hmm. um, with the lights behind him and everything, that was done in Los Angeles. Oh, shit. My role within the production was pretty much making the subjects comfortable to like tell their honest story. Because All American was on the air, they had watched All American. They, they understood that I have been through the high school football, college football, those systems, and I can understand somebody that fell through the cracks that's looking for an opportunity to get to the next level. Yeah. So that became my role. It's just making sure they were comfortable talking to Roy, talking to Andre, talking to some of the football players, and just, just getting them comfortable with, hey, you just tell your version of the truth, and we'll take care of everything else. Um, it really That experience over the past two years really cemented what I feel is my ability to produce. Because I was literally sitting on my couch, saw a story, and said, I want to go get this. And we went and got it. You know, you're talking about, at a time, Rich Paul and Kevin Hart, they had a version of the story that they were going to make. There was another, there was, I think, two other versions of that story yeah. that was attempting to get made. And we fought them off. We It was like, between us and Rich Paul and Kevin Hart, it's like watching the Fire Festival without the main guy. Guys. Like you want to watch the main guy's version of this. So to know that I had the power to like gain the trust of people um, and not even try to like lie to them or anything like that. I, I told no, them you like, did it a very honorable yeah, way. yeah, it was just in the way that, that just in the way that you're saying, you know, the whole thing was around making them comfortable to tell their story. Mm -hmm. There's no angle around this. I tell your story. And of course, you're relatable in that space. And to me, part of allowing someone to tell a story and, and creating stories is just like this, creating safe spaces for people mm -hmm. to be willing to keep it a buck and mm -hmm. be honest around that. And But that's a, there's a skill in that. There's yeah. a skill in like, listen, there's no agenda, man. Like I'm here for, you know, this is interesting and you know it's interesting and yeah, it didn't go in any capacity the way that you thought it was, what this was, but we want to know a little more. So I, I appreciate that, the the way you go into these these conversations, the way you attack that, the way you went into that with the mentality of, nah, let me see if I can, if I can do this. And it organically, it almost said like everything fell in line for you. Yeah. You know, so yeah. that that's gold, man. Was your confidence sky high afterwards? Like in the sense of once you, when you sold it or what? Um, I mean, we were, we were, we were in the shit when we sold it. So, I mean, Usually how it happens is you, you get some life rights or something like that. You make a sizzle, a deck, you pitch it out. Somebody likes it, gives you some money to then yeah. go make it. Now you spend the next year, year and a half making it. It has to solve the rollout. The, we went to Tribeca and did all that. But yeah. with this one, we were actively filming while we were landing our directors, while we were like going to and from Columbus. We were pitching it because it was one of those things where if you're the biggest story in the country, in two weeks, it's nobody's going to care about it. It's extremely time sensitive. So. Yeah. Um, it it just taught me a different way to produce, that there are different ways to produce. Because when I got into this industry, I spent the first like year and a half tr asking everybody, how do you produce? What's the definition of producing? How do you go about producing? Is there a pamphlet? Is there like, can, like what's the <laughs> seminal book yeah. about producing? And nobody could tell me the right answer. Or not even the right answer, nobody can tell me I couldn't, I couldn't find the same answer twice, mm -hmm. I would say. And this experience made me realize, like, no, like, getting resources, bringing resources to a project in the way that you can, that is your version of producing. There's other people that are only doing locations. There's other people that are only doing 
uh, you know, talent relations, whatever, but it's all under the veil of producing. Yeah, there's many and, angles. Too. Yeah, and, and, and this project, solidif- to me, solidified in my head that like, okay, I, c- I can stand next to anybody in the space because I know my process of producing can get results. The other films that you're working on, you want to touch on those? Yeah. Uh, Panorama is a short film that I produced about a year and a half ago that was up to be Oscar shortlisted. Yeah. Uh, it came from the mind of a brilliant writer, director, ex football player uh, named Scott Felix. He's a linebacker at USC. Uh, I think he was USC's first athlete theater uh, grad. Uh, wow. And so it's a guy that's just, you know, he, he looks like he's an athlete. He looks yeah. like us. He's 6'2, six, 6'3, two, six, like 225, 230. Like, look, he can still go out and get it. But he's one of the most poetic, gentle, caring human beings I've ever met. Right. Um, ironically, he was a background actor on All American during the first season. Uh, he was one of the guys like doing the hits and tackling and making it look as real as possible. About he after his first season, he left All American. Uh, he became the director of the Slauson Theater Company, um, and he just over time I followed him on social media, and over time I just saw him directing music videos and and commercials and just doing these really creative things under mm-hmm. his own power. To the point where he just DM'd me one day and was like, hey, man, I, I have this idea for a short film, and I want to see if you'd be interested in producing it with me. I respect you, blah, 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 all that stuff. Because I knew he was already doing the work, and I had seen his progression from like one of the first videos he posted on social media to like... So you're, he asked yeah, me, you're seeing him develop it. Yeah, I, I, I knew I could invest my time and energy in somebody because they were already doing the work. So the first short film... It's about a, a, a young man who loses his mom abrupt, abruptly and is just contemplating life, contemplating what, why is he here, what's going mm-hmm. on, and he has a near-death experience himself what kind of catapults him through the cosmos. He ends up finding his mom, having a conversation with her, and just the theme of the, of the short film is love what's in front of you, um, which means you can take that as love your wife, love your girlfriend, or, or just love the future ahead. Yeah. And... We've over that was the first sort of working thing that we've done together. Um, his DP Corey Gurr is or Gear. I always mess up his name. Sorry, Corey. <laughs> um, we've developed a really tight knit team. Um, my producing partner Dane Mark also helped with the project, and we're into our third project in three years. Our next project, which we're gearing up for a big film festival run, is called Leaves of Glass. Yeah. Um, it's a film set in Mexican folklore. This, uh, yeah, this was interesting. When you said this to me, I'm like, all right, this yeah. is my type. This is different. It's, yeah. yeah, and it's similar to, you know, for us, we wanted to kind of play with the idea of a thriller set in Mexican folklore. So the film takes place in Watts, California. I mean, Watts, Los Angeles. Um, and it's a really cool story of a man whose grandfather is on his last steps and he's understanding is is what is it like to be a good man in this world? Like, how do you define being a good man in this world? But what happens when karma has a say in that? So he goes through this crazy experience with, with a local witch where he doesn't know if, is this just bad luck? Is this karma? Or has something been placed on him? Yeah. Um, it's about 29 minutes. Uh, we, we've, we've already done a screening or two. And we're we're gearing up right now to land a big EP, so we're going to hold screenings over there. I'd love to invite you to it if you, if yeah, you guys course, would like man. to come. But we want this. I feel like this one's going to open up a handful of doors for us. And again, it's the same team that did Panorama. Yeah. And we're just building together. We're we're not really looking outside of ourselves. Um, we're incubating ourselves and our talent and our skills and sharpening these sharpening these tools. So when we do have the big opportunity to direct a future film of the same name or another one, we know we've already done the work to get going. So, Yeah, you guys are definitely doing the reps. And, you know, I look at it as if you want to, these are called like sparring sessions <laughs> in capacity to you saying you, you get a chance to, you know, direct the big major. It's like these are imperative, you know. Yeah. And yeah. in ball they'd be called scrimmages live contact, game script, whatever it may be mm-hmm. that we're putting putting forward. So it makes me really think about like, well, how have you felt like everything that you've done from how you were raised, 
you know, your situation with having an opportunity to go into Beverly Hills High School and how that created a dichotomy of lifestyles and almost like a polarizing lifestyle for you. Then going to school, being in Oregon, which I can't imagine because of the, the Oregon that Nike stuff, you know, that <laughs> whole thing. And then coming to the Giants, winning Super Bowl, all of that and now presenting, what did you feel that you were most prepped with, that you could foresee? And this is this speaks to more the profit aspect of where we're at in this conversation, where the profit PHET, where I feel like you're able to kind of foresee, like, oh, okay, I have an understanding now of where this is going and how to go about this. Mm-hmm. Now, I might not know every every turn, I might not know every every step, but for some degree, I'm kind of laying down this path based upon all the tools, everything that I've come with and the, the things I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. So what, what essentially um, are some things that you've taken away where it's like, yeah, I have this and it's all prepped me for now I can pay it forward? Yeah, I think it's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think it's being comfortable not seeing the full path that you're walking. Um, for, for me, there's little things, especially with playing, where you know you're, you're that extra rep that you're getting, doing some extra work after, after practice, or or getting your body in. In a, you know, towards the end of the season, you guys don't really we don't really run that much anymore yeah. because our bodies are already like built for it. But having that foresight to say, okay, I need to go get on the Versa climber two or three times a week to keep up that cardio, mm-hmm. not knowing like maybe Sunday, maybe I'm running an extra, you know, five minutes or or what have you on the field, but it's it's putting in the work right now to know that I'm preparing myself for a future I can't see. Now, naturally in this industry, everybody wants to do the big film. Everybody wants to, you know, a marker for the past 10 or 15 years has been, damn, what if I get tapped to like produce or direct a Marvel film, a DC film, do something with some big IP around it Mm -hmm. that already has a built-in community around it. And it's, it's, yes, everybody wants that opportunity, but what happens if, you get handed it and you're not ready for it. You know, that's that's something that I learned the hard way with my third year playing in the league, I was sort of handed the starting middle linebacker position. I was a weak side linebacker, but they gave me the headset. And the headset is the, def- the defensive coordinator is giving you the call and you have to make sure everybody gets the call and yep. make all the checks and whatnot. So effectively, you're the unofficial leader of the defense. On that, on that, yeah, on the defense. So you're talking two years prior to this, I'm walking into the Giants facility, seeing Antro Rowe, Justin Tug, the, like these guys that I've grown up watching, and now they're looking at me like, hey, I need the call, and it needs to be right, and you tell me where I need to be. It was the worst experience of my life. Oh, shit. The worst experience of my playing career. That's real. Naturally, as an as a, as a athlete, when you get to the professional ranks, you want to start. Mm-hmm. You, you, you've done all this work because eventually the coach is going to look at you and be like, you're ready to take the mantle and to start. Now, initially I thought, I was like, okay, I'm good. I got this. I got this. And Troy Rose in my ear, you know, bigging me up. Oh, it's your time. You got this. Like, do, you've done all the work, everything. The stress and anxiety that I didn't realize Came was there, yeah. was coming along. I would have thrown that headset back at them if they gave it to me, uh, if I knew that. It was sleepless nights, insecurity, bouts of depression. Because mind you, we started the season 0-6. And, you know, somebody has a headset, you're like, this is my fault. This is all my fault. I'm not prepared enough. So I'm watching extra film. I'm I'm staying up late at night, getting those extra clips in, just thinking... At some point, it's gonna the the levers are gonna break, and mm. this is all gonna work out. And it just never really did to the point where I had to realize, oh shit, my goal of being a starting linebacker in the NFL actually became my nightmare. And maybe it's because I wasn't ready, mm. but I take that as, oh no, you were happy being a special teams player in the in this league and being a, a solid backup linebacker. That's where your happiness was. Yeah. Yet you wanted more. And taking that into TV and film, yes, I want to direct the big things and write the big thing, produce the, the, the tent pole properties, but if I get that too soon, I do not want the experience that I had being handed the starting position with the headset and then feeling like I'm in deep water. 
Yeah. So it's really incubating ourselves now and putting ourselves through as much shit as we can under our own power that when we get that vote of confidence from a big production company or studio or whatnot, we can say, okay, we're built for this now. We can, we can, we can do this. That's, it's got to be something about New York that that <laughs> happens because I had the same similar situation and Tiki Barber said something to me and he was the OG, me and Brandon, when we were there and he said to me, I know you're frustrated, Ryan. And Strahan too. The two of them said this to me after mm -hmm. practice one day. They were like, we know you're frustrated, Ryan. You can see it on your face every day. Keep balling, keep working. And Tiki said, you know, no opportunity comes for everybody. He said, the thing is, though, that most of the time people are unable to see and or take advantage of the opportunity. Mm -hmm. So they probably say, it didn't happen for me. It's like, no, that window was open. You just were not able to, you couldn't move fast enough. Yep. You couldn't jump through the window. You were unable to see that the window was open because yep. you would focus on something else. And he was like, don't let that be you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I got traded That's to great. Green Bay, I worked so hard to come back from injury, to be a part of the Giants, to get a phone call from Reese and be like, you're everything we want as a Giant. You represent exactly what the type of guy we want, blah, blah, blah. We're so proud of you. To then literally say a few minutes later, it's bittersweet. You've been traded to Green Bay. Mm. You know, what comes along with that is the whole anxiety of, yo, I just did all this to recreate and establish myself with a team of guys, brotherhood, mm -hmm. coaches, respect, earn myself back, fighting guys, getting jobs. And now I got to fly tomorrow to yeah. a whole nother city, town, culture, organization that I don't know anybody. Yep. And reestablish myself. I remember the first day I got there, my uncle was like, well, what are you thinking? And I was like, I don't know. He said, but the only thing I can do is make sure that I handle my business and earn the respect of the players and the coaches. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how long I'm going to be here. Yeah. I said, but as long as I just make sure, I don't know if I, what opportunity is going to look like. I stayed in a hotel for the first like six weeks, seven yeah. weeks. So I was yeah. like, oh, listen, I don't know what's about to happen. Yeah. And... As I started to slowly kind of see, like, okay, I can establish myself here. But I knew for myself, it was like, you don't know. You don't know what this opportunity is going to bring. It's like, you just handle your business. You know, chop away, chop away. Stay mm -hmm. in your game, stay in your lane. And I think um, those are things that we if we always, if we can we stick to that. It's like, that's part of our wisdom. When we know that. And I don't know if it's ball. I don't know what it is that created that in us. Or it's like we do know it's like one step at a time, one rep. And maybe it comes from that. It's like, mm -hmm. yo, one rep at a time. Just, you know, I tell people there's such a level of, with ball specifically, there's such a level of unconscious playing that we do. But the only reason why we're able to do that is because of the amount of reps we've taken. Yep. The same thing over and over. Like, listen, I used to take a handoff every day, yep. not even worrying. I used to trust that this dude is going to slide this in. Yeah. <laughs> From since I was nine, yeah. and it's like just because my elbow is so used to like doing that, it's become habitual. It's you know, it's second nature, and there's a level of trust. I'm not looking. I've never looked because there's no way I could perform and mm -hmm. look for that ball. But I think that those deep and rooted things in us allow us to kind of just trust that next step without the unknown. It's like no, as long as we're handling our business, we're moving correctly. We're treating people correctly. We're handling the sense of how we move as a man yeah that's that's what gives us that like quote-unquote wisdom i mean and to to the point about wisdom it's also finding tendencies that's yeah that's In largely absolutely that's largely what a linebacker's job is to do is to deconstruct an offense and find those <laughs> tendencies that Fuck, I used that, to that. <laughs> there are higher percentages in so you know you have I've, I've had the privilege of playing with guys like a Thomas Davis a Luke Keekley yeah you know those guys I can look at just look at a still frame and be like I know what every person on this on this picture is about to do and you press play and it's like fuck how'd you do that yeah but as a linebacker we have been taught to break down offenses to understand higher percentages versus low to understand if they're if, they're, if it's a three by one and the running backs on this side and it's third and more than ten 70% of the time, it's going to be a screen. Yeah. You know, it's it's finding those things. So being able to bring that into my business, into into TV and film producing, where, like, you have a producer talking to you. You have, you have you, you're seeing mandates. You're seeing 
where TV is going, where film is going. Like right now, we're we're being hit over the head with IP stuff, with stuff that's safe, that already has a following. Like, you know, there's a reason why Barbie is the biggest film in the, in the world right now. It's because it's it's like 80 years of of, of pink, branding, you know, yeah, absolutely, of, of great, yeah, of absolutely. branding of all that. It's a reason why Oppenheimer is that because Christopher Nolan himself is IP. And the idea of this bomb that changed the world, that in its own right yeah, is IP. So it's yeah. like bringing some of these these techniques of, of seeing the playing field, seeing the landscape. I'm able to use that just as much as I was able to see, okay, if the centers, if the guard's knuckles are, are grinding into that ground, yeah, he's you know. blowing off the line, it's a run. I need yeah. to like, I need to bow up. If he's light, <laughs> you already know. Yeah, so... so it's it's bringing those tendencies and and the idea of finding connected threads and tissues and tendencies uh, into this line of work to where I'm not really surprised by a lot of the things that are happening in my, in my own space right now. Um, it's self awareness. It goes back to that. Right. It goes it it all to me. It all goes back to how you perceive yourself in this industry and the possible paths that can be taken off of it. Do you? relate everything back to self in relation to how you want to see yourself or how you want to be seen? Yes and no. I think uh, I've, I've had to sort of give up the whole comparison. Act. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there are times, especially early on, where I'm like, Lena Waithe is doing this and Issa Rae's got this and this is like, oh, I'm going to be next to them one day and, I, and it's just like... Stop you, that. Yeah, it's like <laughs> if you're... If you're, if you're my therapist told me this. She, she she went, anybody that's keeping score is losing. Like, you don't keep score if you're winning. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've always kept that with me because she's right. In my in my marriage, in my in my business life, if I find myself keeping score, it's because something's wrong with me in that moment. And mm-hmm. I'm trying to grab at some straw of confidence. So... Yeah, I, I I gave up the rat race of of comparing myself. And that still happens every now and then, but I feel like I'm at a point now where I can acknowledge it and be like, okay, I'm only in my in hindsight, I'm only five years removed from playing. I'm only five years into this industry. Right. The people that I have been comparing myself to have been in this since they graduated yeah. college or was doing something in college. They're, they're already 10, 15 plus years into this. So I'm just to me, I'm always really excited about, damn, what does my life look like in 10 years? Absolutely. Yeah. When, I, when I've put in 10 years worth of work, um, that's, what, that's what gets me excited about this space. Where do you see this industry going? From a, as, as much from a maybe objective space. I think we're heading towards some sort of renaissance in, in TV and film. Uh, I think the large studio format will will kind of be knocked down a peg or two uh i think we'll 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 dive more into human experiences because if, if you've noticed after like in game the the superhero genre has been shit trash ola it's like Thank you. it's Thank like you. i can't like you can't get me to be, to genuinely believe that the bad guy is about to take over the world because we just saw what thanos what thanos yeah. did over the course of two films so, I forget who, I think it was um, Steven Spielberg. He said eventually the superhero film was going to go the way of the Western. The Western was the biggest thing. Like, our grandparents grew up on Westerns. Yeah, I grew up on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, it's, and that's just what, there was always a Western or a Heat of the Night or whatever <laughs> on growing up. That is and, an interesting perspective, yeah. And now we're going to move beyond that. And I think we're going to kind of get back into those art house type films, yeah. lower budget films, and get extremely specific on the stories that are being told. Like, I don't care if there's the next superhero bad guy that's going to like fuck up the universe or the multiverse or whatever. I wanna understand what's happening, a rom-com off of Slauson and Western. I wanna understand perspective of of people, relatable stories of of seeing myself in these people. I think we'll get back to some sense of that. There's always going to be the big ten poles. Yeah, yeah, that's always going to be there. But I think, I think the audience is yearning for simplicity, 
a, a, a little bit more than we have been. Um, we're in this IP wave right now, and I think that's just because studios are scared. Yeah. Um, the streaming model needs to be needs to be reimagined, um, reconstructed. You need to protect the writers. Um, this whole AI thing that's coming. Yeah. What, what what people don't realize about AI is that anything that you can possibly think of, specifically in our industry, will likely be viable in the next couple of years. There's going to be an AI that can write the best script ever and whatnot. But what AI can't do is have a lived experience. Uh, I say that all the time. It, Everything that we pull as humans is from experience and feeling. Mm-hmm. Every thought, everything has come something. Whether it's the wind blew and it ta- and it exactly. anything exactly. There is not that. And I don't, when everybody talk about singularity, I'm like, no, there will always be. And yes, and it might be super hard to see a difference. It might be, but there's something intrinsic to our experience in the fact that it's based upon mm-hmm. how we feel mm-hmm. and what we experience and go through and um, the emotions or whatever it may be. So I'm I'm right with you with that. Like. It's not the same. It's it's not the same, but it's yeah. it's also AI is being built on on the back of, of lived experiences. Of you know, you can put all these books around us into a computer, and an AI can think of the best story for it. But I think there's going to be something to the idea of a human experience almost being at a premium in yeah. the future. You know where. We're going online, you know, you're going to have like VR, you're going to have the, the metaverse and all these different spaces. And that's great. It's going to be fun watching concerts and, and basketball games, being front row and whatnot. But I think the idea of a lived experience of my, the, my favorite thing to do now is go to concerts, is go to festivals. Yeah, real connection. Real connect, going to Hollywood Bowl. You know, when it's when it's sixty degrees, seventy degrees outside, and watching a Jill Scott, watching a Maxwell, watching, you know, I just went to the Quincy Jones ninetieth anniversary, like being in person. I think will have a premium all to its own in the future. I'm talking art. I'm talking theater. Like, there's going to be a version. There's going to be an artist that comes out, and he's not going to he or she's not going to be on social media. If you want to see their art, you got to come to this space. There's yeah. going to be no phones. And you're gonna to have to experience. You're gonna actually have to. You're gonna actually do it. You're gonna actually have to be present. I'm, I'm excited for that too, because you can't tell me, the lived experience, is lesser than an AI experience. When you talk about the word simplicity, what do you mean by that? Because, I do look at, a lot of times, Marvel movies and these more grandiose movies mm-hmm. as simple, mm-hmm. and maybe I might use the word, basic. Because they're not really diving deep into the human experience. And I think yeah. they've done a better job. You know, that's why people have kind of connected. But overall, when you talk about they're going to go back to the simple, you actually, in my capacity, mean they're going to go back to the deeper. Exactly. More one to one connect. But yeah, but expand on that a little. Yeah, when I, when, you know, when I say simplicity, I, I mean exactly that. I mean diving deeper into the human experience without the bells and whistles of graphics, of needing needing a spaceship or you know, an insurmountable odd, yeah. you know, coming up against, like, am I, to me, an insurmountable odd can be a father that is trying to pay his bills to keep food on the table and he has no way of, of making an income. Mm-hmm. Who has been laid, like, to me, getting back to those sort of neighborhood type stories. You know, you, you, th- you look at a Marvel, you look at a DC, and these are universes. Like, I think there's a way that you can take that same model and bring that into a community neighborhood feel. So my, and I might I might be giving ideas to somebody out there, but by all means, take it and run with it. My my goal in this industry would be to one day tell the story of Los Angeles like how Marvel has told its universe. You know where you can have a rom com set in Lamert Park. Somebody from that film Builds is on. from Silver Lake, Ooh. and now they're going through, you know something over there but that's set in the form of a thriller you know their best friend is probably from Santa Monica and now you're dealing with an action psychological something like being able to tell the history and the different people that populate Los Angeles through different scopes and genres to me would be when I talk about being simple getting back to some 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 form of simplicity to where you don't need 
the 200, 300 million dollar budget to tell a dope story. To you keep get, somebody engaged. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's what I'm hinting at. I, I don't have it all figured out right now, but I think that's that's actually what I'm yearning for. Like my favorite film to watch when I'm in my own head or when I'm feeling less than or whatever, I watch Swingers. You know, oh, John yeah. Favreau yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, um, Vince Vaughn when they were coming up because I love that movie, but I love the story of how that movie was made. It was made for like 125000 And this was something that they, they, they bet on themselves. They made this movie with favors and with friends. And now, you know, John Favreau pretty much started the Marvel Universe with Iron Man. You know, Vince Vaughn had the legendary career that he had with with his stint. Yeah. Um, but it's getting back to those type of films of highlighting the human struggle within various genres, even doing bringing that into sports. You know, I, I still think we can tell sports stories through the scope of thriller, action, horror, rom com, and beyond. Mm-hmm. It doesn't always have to be from the lens of like a Remember the Titans. You know. I appreciate you you voicing that because it's essentially why I created this mm-hmm. to be able to allow people to hear perspective in life mm-hmm. and that I think we all relate to mm-hmm. the human experience and on a few different levels you know on individuals who quote unquote society is seen as successful and of course I want people to see that they're still working through all the stuff of life and then in the same breath the other individuals that are not seen that don't have the platforms to be able to see that their story is even more relatable there's a reason why the show Atlanta did what it did and was so iconic there's a reason why Insecure did what it did you know even you going back to even Martin living single yeah. these were shows that highlighted a specific experience a specific struggle within primarily the black community of just like I'm young I have all the energy in the world to go and get it but now I gotta take on life. Yeah, I think that's why Martin Living Single and these other shows are so evergreen, is because it doesn't matter when it happened, we can understand what they're going through. You can even if you don't, they don't really talk about it. You can understand that Martin probably can't pay his bill one month and he's still leaning on Gina. You can understand how how Khadijah Living Single is trying to buy a new printer, but she's running everything else in in Flavor Magazine. You can understand what they're going through a lot of the stuff that you don't even see on camera. Like Issa, when she did uh, Awkward Black Girl, she, this one clip that I always remember is when she sees somebody she knows and they're the only two walking down a long hallway. We all had that experience, experience of like, damn, I'm going to look at everything else until the last the possible last second. I'm like, hey! Like, like, <laughs> like it's, it's leaning into finding those, like, those common experiences that everybody goes through is why shows like that like will live on forever. Or... How do you, and I think, you know, I I would say that, you know, you talk about not keeping score in relation to trying to create those spaces. How do you, how do you find that balance? Because it is, it's a, it can be difficult in the industry and stuff like that. You know, yeah. you're, you're essentially, you're in an industry that is ruled right now by money mm-hmm. and ruled by these production houses that in my opinion are so scared based upon their track record of I don't want to lose money so yeah. they you know <laughs> they they work in a particular space and they work with machines where it's like the big budgets are so high because at least they know that they'll make their money back they're not going to take on a real creative um, risky movie that essentially they're not going to it's like if this formula works and it's easy for as humans that's relatable yeah. to do what works it's like we we know this, and then in the same breath, somebody's got to shake some shit up. Somebody's got to be prime. Mm-hmm. Somebody's got to be Dion out here and shake some shit up mm-hmm. and stay true to who they are and yeah. really, you know, trailblaze, pioneer in these spaces. So, how do you do that? Like, how do you foresee yourself doing that? How are you just continuing to doing that? I mean, on, on one side of it, it's when I find myself keeping the score, it's because I'm looking up. It's because I'm, I'm looking up and seeing the landscape and seeing who's who am I close to, who's far, who can I feel like I can get myself to. When I catch myself doing that, it, it just reminds me, okay, put your head back down. Like, put your head back down, keep firing, get to work. 
you know, when I'm, when I'm actively writing, when I'm, you know, interior, office, night, writing those slug lines, like thinking of those, that, that dialogue, I literally can't think about anything else because that is such a world to me in its own that if I'm not 100% present there, I'm not giving my all to whatever script or idea that I'm, that I'm pouring into. So when I do find myself keeping score looking up, it just reminds me, put your head back down. Oh. Just put your head back down. Put your head back down. Get to work. Because it's, it's, and I don't know if any of you guys have ever, you know, practiced screenwriting, but there are, there are those moments of enlightenment that you have where you can't just think of something while you're having coffee and it's the perfect line. And you're like, oh, let me write that down because that's the perfect thing that goes here. Sometimes it happens, but you can only find the best version of the story that you're writing when you're writing it. And, you know, I've I, I read, you know, Rick Rubin's book and all these other creative books. And there's this there's this common energy of it of there's an energy plane that's just all above us right now. And it's sort of an information highway. And when you're tapped into what you're doing in that moment, that is when you can pull from that energy. That's when those great ideas come is when you're is when you're in the shit, in the process of creating you can only pull from that energy when you're in that process. So once I read that, I've always felt it, but once I read that, it just reminded me like, damn, I need to stay in this process as long as I can. Because like even like Rick, Rick Rubin said, he's like, whenever you have an idea and it's the best idea in the world, but you don't act on it. And then six months later, you see that see idea in the world. He's like, that idea wasn't yours. No, it was just... Eat. It was just time for that idea to be in the world. You don't have ownership over that idea. Now, if you were able to catch it, reel it in, and manifest it, then you can say you have a claim for it. But, you know, we always we all have those ideas are, that so are like, damn, I thought, Yo, about, I thought, that about, that I thought about that <laughs> shit. Damn, <laughs> that my, that's my idea. And it's like, you know, we were we were we were randomly like sued for all American early on because a guy thought we took his idea. He thought I was like a corporate plant. And, and I was like, nah, man, like I lived this life. <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, I'm telling my story, but it just goes back to that. You know, when we were thinking of all American and the stories for it and all that, like we were pulling from a creative well that if we didn't lean into it, it would have passed us up. And then there would have been another, athlete that told this story or whatnot and it would have been a version of all american i would have been like damn like i had that idea like six seven months ago i should yeah, act yeah. so it's staying in the creative flow is is where is where the real juice happens or yeah i, I think um uh, i look at it as we're pulling from the ether mm -hmm. and yeah sometimes you pull and slip or you pull, look at it for a little while, and you throw it back up there. Yeah. It ain't yours. Yeah. Um, that's where time, that's where time just doesn't exist, because, you know, there'll be times I'll be looking down, and I'll look up, and it's three hours later. Then I'll look down again, it's two hours, and I'm like, what the yeah, fuck? Yeah, I've been in this. But it's that energy. It's that energy of time doesn't exist here. You know, if you're in creation, time doesn't matter. In the beginning, when I asked you, what do you do, you spoke about, being a bridge and taking these resources and being able to put them out for your friends, for your community. Mm -hmm. How essentially important is it to have bridges and to be a bridge? It's paramount. Um, you know, I, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles in the 90s. I'm, I'm one of three brothers. Uh, twin half sisters, um, you know, my parents raised us in the mid '90s at the height of what we know South Central to be. You yeah, know, so. all all the films that you've that you've seen that depict South Central are film mere blocks away from where I grew up. You know, so coming from that environment, understanding what sports is in that environment, what gang life is, what drugs, what just the 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 hovering idea of what South Central is, there's not a lot of opportunity. But I had the fortunate experience of going to Beverly Hills High School. And I, I got to see, oh shit, like y'all living different over here. 
Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Y'all live a little bit different. Yeah. You know, like you guys, you guys have resources. You guys yeah. have access. You guys have abundance over here. It's bringing that energy back to my neighborhood. So, yeah. you know, where I live now versus where I grew up is a mere three minute drive. I, I take... I take a right, a left, drive straight for two minutes, make another right, and I'm, I'm, I'm back on my old stopping grounds. And that was by design. You know, I could have lived in Beverly Hills. I could have lived in Marina, Santa Monica, or these places that exude, oh, you made it, you know? Yeah. I specifically chose to come back to this area because I know, I knew this area needed yet another bridge. I'm not the only one, sure. but it's it's something to when somebody that has gone through it that's done it and has come back to his neighborhood to say we're going to figure this out together you know it's making the next generation not have to go through everything that I went through just to get that slice of life Absolutely. you know so you know being that bridge by definition a bridge is connecting two points where in the middle of that is a canyon is 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 a valley that you can't really navigate so for me, being that bridge is I'm going to lay down myself and allow resources to flow to and from because if I can get that kid that's never seen Hollywood, that's never been on, been on a stage or a sound set, whatever, to understand, hey, man, if you want to be in this industry, you don't just have to be the actor or the director. Because that's all, that's all kids. When they yeah, grow up, they're like, I just want to be the biggest star ever. I can bring you to an all-American set, which I've done multiple times, and I've shown, you know, black and brown kids like you see the four people that are on set right now that are that are on camera. Turn around, look at the hundred people behind you that are working professionals, yeah. that work on the biggest productions in Hollywood right now. That guy's wearing a Marvel jacket because he he helped shoot second unit on Endgame. That guy just was a something for for another Christopher Nolan mm -hmm. like teaching kids that you don't have to be the the point zero one percent in an industry to be considered a professional um kind of demystifying the landscape of of the tv and tv and entertainment industry for them and then on the other side of it the community aspect yeah. you know bringing businesses into our neighborhood you know i'm an investor in, in hilltop coffee and kitchen where i never had anything like that growing up right. i never had a neighborhood coffee shop that my mom and dad can just pull up to and we find ourselves being there for two or three hours. The, the only spaces for that growing up was either the park you played sports at yeah. or the barbershop. There was, there was no fast, casual eatery to where you walk in and you immediately see somebody you know, that you fuck with, yeah. that you want to have that second drink with at the coffee shop and just be there because you know in 10 minutes, somebody else somebody is going to walk gonna come, in yeah. and now... You guys are right here, and now all your kids are in that table, like playing their games and running around. Like, it's bringing that energy to it. You know, within the first year that Hilltop was open, I remember walking in and seeing a group of kids just like at a table, and they were drinking a little teas and stuff. And I was just like, damn, like, we helped bring this to the neighborhood. There wasn't another version of this before. What's going to happen when they're, you know, 20, 25, 30, and now have maybe the capital or the experience point. to get it going? It's like, like, yo, you got memories. Remember when we were at Hilltop? Exactly, exactly. Right. So it's and it's creating those experiences for for specifically kids in our neighborhood that when they go into these larger spaces or these different spaces, they don't feel less than. I think specifically going to Beverly Hills was the best decision that my parents ever made for me because at 13 years old, it forced me to understand different cultures and ethnicities beyond their skin tone. You know, it was it was understanding what Rosh Hashanah is. Oh. It was it was understanding what a Bat Mitzvah is. It yeah. was going to them. It was it was getting to the point where I can look at you and acknowledge that you're different, but then understanding that we're in a we're in a similar experience together. And now, yeah. for me, it's about making sure young black and brown kids moving forward don't feel like they're the outlier in the room. And when they do feel like that, use it to their advantage. You know, they. they there's a thing where, you know, you can be the token black guy in the room. And some people you know. think of that as, oh, shit, you're the token black guy, so, like, you got to move accordingly. Sometimes I think of it as, like, I might be the most interesting man in this room because I'm the only person in this room that looks like how I look. Yeah. So I'm going to use that to my Absolutely. advantage. So 
opportunity. Yeah, it's just it's it's building opportunities, it's building bridges, building creating thoroughfares for for kids from our neighborhood to go out and be great. Beautiful, man. I think um, that wraps into my last question, which I always end with. You talk about being a bridge. You told me what you do. You clearly displayed and articulated what you're doing. Who are you, Spencer? Man, I'm I'm a father first and foremost. I'm a husband, and I'm just I'm I'm a guy trying to figure it out every single day. I'm I'm not I haven't arrived by any means. Um, I'm learning. I'm learning every step of the way, and I hope to always be in that energy. Man, I I appreciate that, and I appreciate you taking the time, man. This is. This has been different from most conversations, but for me, even more valuable because you are very much a reflection. Um, and you've not you're you're also a line of accountability with me, so I appreciate mm-hmm. you, brother. And whether you know or not, we became closer. Yeah, we homies now. I don't even know. We we yeah, we, we we homies now. So I'll tell you. I wish you that. That's um, fine. And uh, I appreciate you taking the time, man. This is this is dope. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. And um, yeah, let's build. Now we got to build from here. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. I, I I love the space that you created. Um, when Nelly hit me about this. Uh, I say no to a lot of podcasts because I, f- I find myself just playing the hits yeah, yeah, yeah. and the conversation never goes beyond let's talk about upbringing football all American yeah. and whenever I can look at a platform and know that you know they want to go deeper yeah. they want to know who I am as a person and beyond um, those are the ones I say yes to and this is absolutely that so right. I, I this might be the best podcast I've ever been on so we talk. We we we, we, in it, we staying in it. Yeah, we staying in it. I'm staying in it. I'm staying in it. head down, <laughs> hey, head down. Tight, stay I tight. You know, I, yeah. I know. Right? You know what? Listen, it's funny. I never celebrated when I scored touchdowns, and people used to always be like, "Yo, why you don't do nothing?" I'm like, "Cause that's what I'm supposed to do." Right. Mm-hmm. So you know what? I appreciate. It. That's what you're supposed to say, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm supposed to be. Yes, but that's what I'm creating, and I appreciate it. But from from like minded, and people I respect. To hear that, it just reinforces what I do. So, much respect, brother. And um, I wasn't feeling the best today. Um, But you actually allowed me to tap into my flow state in Mm. regards to like, man, I'm in this. And so, yeah, once again, you you helped me be better. How can people get in contact with you? You know how yes, do they how they yes. find you how they reach you. Um, I know people are gonna watch this and be like, I listen. I know they said that they got the next. One. I got the next <laughs> one. Everybody's gonna have the next one. So how do, yeah. how do people bombard you with that? Yeah, you, you can find me on Twitter and social. I mean Twitter and Instagram at Paysinger P Y S N G R. It's my okay. last name without the vowels. Um, my production company's handles are More Street M O O R E Street dot okay. co. That's my website as well as our social media handles. So. P-Y-S-N-G-R or morestreet.co on both Twitter, uh, website, and social media, and Instagram. Don't come with no half ass shit. <laughs> Please, just, you know, if you, whatever you think you're going to give, just scratch it up, write it again, and then have somebody else read it before you send it out. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. This has been dope. So, I'm, I'm glad y'all tuned in, and I know y'all pulled away some shit from here, because, man... See, all these conversations are dope. Like, I said, I know I got something. Yeah. <laughs> like, because, I listen, if anything, I'm pulling away. Everybody in this room is mm-hmm. going to get better. Mm-hmm. That's why Zoe don't be leaving. <laughs> there was no agreement that said, yeah. like, Zoe be like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just making yeah. sure everything goes smooth. I think it's like, y'all don't spend none of my books. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> no, man, but this is the illest. Like, appreciate you. For real, dog. Like, Pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you for having me.